Hello everyone, today it's Thursday, November 5th, 2020, and this is the week in charts. I obviously want to thank all you guys and girls for making it to the show tonight. Sorry about all the confusion with the show times. Lately it's been at 6 central time, and I don't know whether we should bring it back to the daytime or not, but a lot of people have thanked me for bringing it tonight, so we'll see how that plays out. So what are we talk about? Well, obviously current market conditions, I'm going to have a tremendous amount to talk about there. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks, if you don't mind, with your questions, if you can keep them relative to the slide, just so the just so my ADD doesn't kick in. And then on your favorite stock picks, wait until we get to the live charts. Ask about as many as you want, but for also for your benefit, just ask about one at a time and hit return. That way we'll know. So what are we talking about? Well, I came in this morning thinking, okay, I, I've been really, in the back of my head, I've been really thinking about a little bit of not not so much the holistic trader, which is mind, money, money management, but that would be kind of part of it. But more like the the holistic you and how whether or not you're feeling good or your mental attitude or what's going on in your life affects your trading. And there's a lot of things I, I eventually want to get into there. And, and then I got to thinking like, let's just boil trading down down to its essence. But I also wanted to do a relevant lesson. So somehow all that morphed into IPOs, <laughs> which is my favorite thing. And favorite thing lately, at least. And I still think they're the next big, big thing. And so we're going to come back to the trading psychology. And I've been really working hard to kind of boil it all down. And I think you're going to see a lot of that research in coming weeks. But for now, since the IPOs are doing really well, I want to focus on that, and I always want to try to show you something that's working now, not to be the church of what's working now, but something that's working now that we could use in our trading. That'll make a lot more sense in a few minutes. This is the screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then, according to the line from my friend Greg Morris. When I did the IPO course, I think it was in 2014, I was trying to come up with a name for it. And just kind of out of the blue, I was thinking, well, these things really don't trade on reality. They trade on the promise and they trade on the promise of the future. And the more I thought about it, it's like, well, that makes a lot of sense. It doesn't matter if longer term it's a good company or longer term it's a bad company or whatever. It just has to go up, right? It, for us to make money. That kind of goes back to what I was thinking about earlier, boiling down trading to its utmost essence. And when I did the course and I came up with the buy a B pattern, I was thinking that they really are a technician's dream. Now, as you know, technical analysis is all based on the fact that if a market is going to go from A to B, I'm sorry, technical analysis is based on the fact that the market should go from A to C it's going to have to go through B along the way. So I came up with the idea of what if we just buy at B, so to speak. Now, in an individual issue that's been trading for a while, that issue might have some bad memories, some overhead supply, or a lot of people that might just be looking to get out. But with an IPO, there's a bit of euphoria to them. And what I discovered, it's kind of like the old Will Rogers saying, Buy stocks that go up. If they don't go up, don't buy them. And that seems to be pretty much true. You could almost, and I use the word almost with a few caveats, but you could almost just buy the IPOs that are going up and ignore the ones that are going down. And that's where buy at B comes from. So again, if I didn't make that clear earlier, if a market's going to go from A to C and B is somewhere in between, we're looking to buy at B. In other words, when it's making a new closing high. Now, a lot of times IPOs come public and they just die and they die. And I did some screen captures a few minutes ago and I'll show you how this pattern repeats over and over again. And when I was doing my, when I woke up this morning and started doing a lot of IPO analysis, I'm amazed at how many IPOs come public and within the first week, within the first week they die out. Remember, that's our one of our ground rules is we can't, trade an IPO or do not trade an IPO until the close at the least on day five. So let me just kind of rewind that a little bit. So let's say an IPO comes public on Monday. The earliest we would trade it would be five days and that would be the close 
of day five. Now, again, you could stay out of a lot of trouble just by not buying IPOs if they don't go up, believe it or not. It's pretty amazing. I use the sardine, the story of sardines. I think everybody knows that story by now. The gist of it is there were a bunch of sardine traders on a wharf, and a guy got all excited, and he paid top dollar for some sardines, got home, opened them up. They were rotten. And so he tracked down the guy that sold to him. The guy said, silly fool, those sardines are for trading, not eating. So you want to make sure you unload your IPOs if, or more accurately, when they begin to die. Now, one of the most common patterns that I've identified, I think it's a half a dozen, and it might be a few more common patterns that happen with IPOs. But one of the most common patterns next to the die and the die that you just saw is the fly in the die. And a lot of times an IPO will take off, there's, there's this promise of the future, this is it's excitement, and then the reality sets in or that promise fails to materialize or fails more accurately in most cases to materialize as great as everyone thought. And it seems that lately with COVID and everything going on, there's this new excitement in IPOs for those type of stocks and a lot of other stocks that to me seem like they have nothing to do with COVID but are going up anyway. So with the flying die, you can make a lot of money in the fly phase. Just make sure you take taking partial profits along the way, doing all that money management that I talk about. I have a bum knee, so I might be kind of dancing a little tonight, <laughs> standing on one leg, bouncing. So let me just give you the gist of the buy a B. There's a lot of nuances, and we'll flesh out a few of those in a few minutes. And I've covered it quite a bit. But again, you're going to buy IPOs in the first closing high on or after day five. That's the first new closing high. Now, if day high, if, if day one sets the high for the first week, it must also close above the day one high. Otherwise, don't worry about the day one high. That'll make a lot, a lot more sense in a minute. As a general statement, avoid stocks that are greater than $20. Now, when I did the IPO course back in 2014, $20 seemed to be the cutoff. And I said, guys, look, that might vary a little bit, but that's what I'm seeing right now. And right now, 2020, I'm seeing that some IPOs that are a little bit higher than $20 are beginning to work or still working really well with this pattern, or I should say beginning to work really well with this pattern. So the $20 rule, I'm a little bit more leaning on, maybe go to maybe $25 or so. When they're over 30, I do get a little skeptical. And it seems like if they're priced too high or if they come public too high, they're gonna die. And that's one of my concerns, even after day five. And there's plenty of secondary setups. In fact, we could look for a closing high plus a little bit of momentum. And I'll show you that in a minute with the Landry Light setup. So again, as a general statement, you want to avoid stocks more than $20 a share for this particular pattern or wait for the Landry Light setup along with the buy ID, which I'll show you in one second. And that would be the momentum filter. So you want to make sure if it's greater than $20 a share, and again, maybe let's use $25 in today's market. But so if it's greater than $25 a share, ideally you want to see some acceleration too, such as one bar of Landry Light on the day that you're looking to get long. And I'll show you that in one second. Now there's some details. The range, you wanna have really good range. We're gonna go through a bunch of little IPOs real quick. I did some FinBiz screen captures. And you wanna make sure you got a really good range for this pattern. And, and I don't have an exact amount, but let's say if a stock runs from like nine to 14, you got 40, 50% run or 40% range high to low. That's probably enough range for a buy at B. Volume is tricky because you only have five days of trading. And as John Ross, who I don't know if John's, yeah, John's here tonight. Hey, John. As John Ross pointed out, you kind of end up in a hotel California situation. Sometimes you get into these stocks, they look like they have enough volume, and then the volume dies out. It happens. Pronounce with a silent SH, or spell with a silent SH, I should say. Now, here's one that's a little tricky. What's the story, fad or glory? 
ideally, I mean, there's some banks out there that have come public lately. There's another stock, it kind of escaped, oh, uh, Academy Sports. It's actually working out pretty good, but it's kind of hard for me to get excited about a sporting goods store. But it, it can be something that it doesn't necessarily have to be splitting the atom. I have, well, I do have one stock now. Uh, I think I have one biotech and I think I have one sort of semiconductor type of stock right now in IPOs. I might have a couple other ones. I'm not sure what each one does. But if it's some sort of fad or something, it could be like um, <laughs> yoga clothes is an example I often use. Uh, Lululemon did incredibly well. I made fun of the stock because it was low, yo uh, yoga clothes. I don't know what's wrong with my mouth tonight. And the stock went up 40% over a few days, and I was pretty upset about that. So it can be a fad. Glory could be, at this stage, could be something maybe semiconductor related for webcams because everybody's going crazy to get a webcam now. Everybody's getting crazy, going crazy to get this um, Elgato equipment. I'm like, I'm using right now, and I had it before, but I've got um, an Elgato Stream Deck. I've got a professional mic or a semi-professional mic, and I've, I've got a professional camera or semi-professional camera now. So all that stuff is, is kind of like a COVID excitement right now, even though those areas might not be that exciting in the past or have been that exciting in the past. Right now, there's some excitement there, like CRSR, we're long that one. And we'll take a look at that one in the live chart, we get a chance. So this was an example from a while back, but this is what a buy a B looks like. One, two, three, four, five days of trading. And notice that the high was set on day one. And you carry that forward and you can see that it began to take off. Now this one, this is kind of an interesting example because it didn't have any range to speak of. It was up around 17 to 15. That's a fairly narrow range. So I wouldn't get too excited about that. But on the day that it triggered, the range began to expand. You can see it ran up to like 20. So 2015 round numbers, what's that? About 30% uh, or so. So in a case like this, we're gonna buy market on close. Now the market on close buy could be a little tricky. And I'm gonna show you a case where I actually bought in, but technically it was not an official setup or technically it didn't trigger. And that's one thing that, and this is kind of how I backed into doing IPOs today, is I want to show you things in practice that are a little bit more difficult than in theory. Yogi Berra once said, in theory, practice and theory are the same, and practice they are not. And it's really easy to look at these charts and say, oh, well, close at a new closing high. I would have just bought it, just like Dave said. Sometimes it's not quite that easy because sometimes it might look like it's gonna close at a new closing high as you'll see in a few minutes and then back off. And then it also takes kind of a big leap of faith because you push that button right going, right going into close and you're like, oh my goodness, what have I done? It seems like if you trigger into something during the day, it's like, ah, it's doing okay, it's doing so-so, looks like it's hanging in there or whatever. You kind of got a little bit of that Jackie Mason thing going on watching it, but it's kind of like when you, hit that buy button going into the close, it, it, take, it does take a big leap of faith. And believe me, I know that, but it's, it's really one of my favorite patterns. So this was uh, an example I showed over the summer. And I just wanted to grab a snapshot from one account to show that I was actually taking the trade. Anyway, you can see bought on the close and then I was blessed. And this is where, this is one of the most amazing things and cool things about the buy at B. It's sometimes in after hours, you get blessed with a really nice profit and you really don't want to look that gift horse in the mouth. So sometimes within an hour of being in the trade, and sometimes even much less, sometimes with 10 or 15 minutes after the close, you see some big follow, follow through push coming going through. And in a trade I'm gonna show you in a few minutes, I think that's what I may have anticipated or hoped for. I know I just said hope and it didn't work out that way. But that's what I was thinking could happen. And then you can see it came back in and then I scratched out on the remainder on that one. So here's another example, one, two, three, four, five. And I'm gonna show you some live examples in just one minute. When I did this presentation over the summer, this, these were live examples. So now we have a closing high on day four, okay? 
you have to have at least five days worth of trading. What's the highest close? We're not as concerned about the high unless it happens on day one, because the closing high is kind of a more of a stealthy type of setup. So if we look at the highest high, which also happens to be set on day four, we could see that's above the day one high. So we're not worried about a close above the day one high anymore. The closing high is what we're looking for. Now, here's another case where the range was fairly tight, but by the time it triggered low to high, about 30% or so. So it's kind of on the cusp of not being enough, but I figured it was worth a shot. It looked pretty decent. So in a case like this, you buy market on close, and that's the trades there. You can see I bought a little bit before the close, and I think that was in anticipation of it was up nicely, so I thought it would at least hold until the close. And that's where you got to be careful because sometimes it might not, it might not make it. Now, it kind of went back and forth a couple of days, but then it took off, and within a few days sold half of it. And then had a pretty good ride in this one. And then eventually, unfortunately, as all trades do, they eventually end badly. But in this case, I think I scratched out or at least got a profit out of it. I'll have to go in and check. Now, here's the other one. One, two, three, four, five. Where was the high set? Day one. Okay. So we carry that forward. And the closing high was also set on day one, too. But we take the greater of the five-day closing high and the day one high. That's a really easy way of putting it. The greater of the five-day closing high and the day one high, okay? So since the high was set on day one, we go with that, even though the closing high was set on day one too. Now, notice that we penetrated that day one high. Is that a buy? No, because it did not close above that high, but the next day it did, so it was a buy, market on close. And I still have a, I still have multiple positions in this one across multiple accounts, and I don't know why I didn't stop out. I probably should have on that one, so I may have violated a rule on that one. But it really hasn't set the world on fire just yet. I think I'm slightly in the black. I think what I was hoping for, I know there's that word hope, but I think I was hoping that company being a SPOC, it would get caught up in the SPOC fever. When I did the, I didn't know what it called SPOCs back in the day, but when I did the IPO course, I said, just ignore all those acquisition companies because they were just dumb st dumb stocks. And then it's it looks like now the bloom might be off the rose in a lot of those because I'm noticing quite a few of them are dying out and they were hot hot earlier this year and now they're kind of dying out a little so we'll see now i use a lot of tools in my analysis and you could do something similar with stock charts and when i did a presentation on ipos over the summer for stock charts in my trading simplified shows i i use their candle glance charts which looks similar to these my only criticism of the candle glance charts is they could be a little bit bigger and maybe i can experiment with my browser and get them bigger but that's one thing i need to talk to them about and they've been very accommodating in uh, in, a, in adjusting or, or creating things for me and it's been really cool and you, you'll see me using a lot of their stuff more and more but the point is i make i, I do use a lot of tools and my analysis, FinDiz, IntelliChart, and Metastock, and it's probably two or three other ones I'm forgetting, including stock charts, of course, especially the stock charts ACP platform, which is very crucial to a lot of the work I've been doing, especially in 2020, since they made some cool indicators for me there. But anyway, just grabbing the FinDiz charts for the IPOs that came public over the last month. I just want to kind of show you my mindset. And so I'm not sure what this stock is. It made a big wide range on day one. So far, it hasn't closed above that wide range. The range from the low to high is fairly narrow. So I would have to do a little bit more research on that one. Check out the volume. This one here, just kind of sideways and chopping around. This ALGM, I'm going to walk you through this trade in a few minutes. I actually bought it. And it was a bit of a false signal, a bit of a fake out, but I did buy this one 
and at 21 and change. And I'll walk you through that in one, in one second. But you can see the ALGM, you got one, two, three, four. And then the fifth day, I thought it was a new closing high, but it turned out that it wasn't. And that'll make sense in a few minutes. So that ALGS, you can see just kind of a chop it around and it hasn't taken out the high of day one. And we would have to confirm whether or not it has enough volume to trade. ARRY is what I call a first deep retracement. That was on the Landry list. Now this AVIR would be a good example of a buy at B, except it's $34 a share. So in a case like that, I would add in a five-day SMA and make sure it's also closing above that five-day SMA. AZO, AZYO, die and die so far at least. BDXS eh, looks kind of range bound and choppy. We need to figure out if that's enough range or not for trading. The high was also set on day one, so it's going to have to take out that high. We also need to check the volume. Speaking of volume, BVT, you can see those little, uh, you call them a doji bar, I don't know what, what do you call them? What do you call them? Just a tick, just a tick on the chart. <laughs> I, did I slip and use a term <laughs> that I'm not supposed to know about? What are all these funny looking charts? These charts are funny looking. Well, that's all that uh, Finviz will allow you to use in this. But anyway, when you just have a little tick, it's probably super low volume. So I'd have to check volume in another program. So I'm guessing that's too thin. And this one here, it's got a really tight range. So we'll have to see. I mean, it's at around $10 or 986, 975. So not enough range for me to get excited about that one. Here's another one with a pretty narrow range. So that would be a question mark. This one here, volume's probably too thin on that one. And also the range is really, really small, like a 20 cent range on that. So let's just get through these real quick and then we'll look at some live examples. Another tight range, about a one point range on that one, or actually 30 cent range. This one just died out. Okay, that's a no brainer. If you don't walk away with anything tonight, don't buy IPOs that are going straight down, okay? Another one, thin range, you kind of get the idea. Is it a unit? I don't know. I don't know if that U means at the end. This one's narrow range. And again, you can see plenty, plenty narrow range ones. This one came public at 35, around 35. So it wouldn't be a buy at B, but maybe if it begins to rally and has a nice little pullback, it might be worth trading provided there's plenty enough volume on that one. And again, another range issue, a die and a die. Yeah, keep asking questions and uh, I'll answer those that are relevant to these slides and then we'll get through and we'll, we'll get through the rest of them, okay? Another tight range there, another tight range there, another tight range there. So you kind of get the idea. Now this Gato kind of caught my eye a little bit, but that's only a one point move. So we'll have to check the volume, but it might be worth watching to see if it can develop a trend. I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy a buy at B in in a stock that is only about a one point move. I know percentage wise it's pretty big because it's lower price, but I wouldn't get that excited about that one just yet. And again, we'll have to check the volume. Now again, not to bore you to death. I know too late, huh? Now a range on that one. Now a range on this one. Now a range on this one's probably a unit or something. Not sure what that is. This one has a narrow range. This one so far has just died out. Also thin. This one's kind of died out after the fifth day. Also has a pretty narrow range. Now this one looks kind of interesting. We need to see if it's thin or not. IH, but you see it did that first deep retracement. It took off, pulled back sharply. And a lot of times they'll go back to the old highs when they do this. That's a pretty cool pattern. This one obviously headed the wrong way. This one started to do a first deep retracement, but it did a 100% retracement. So you would avoid that one, obviously. Another tight range. Now you guys were talking about the LESL. I couldn't get excited about it because it's pool supplies. And this might be another nemesis of mine or something to do with pools and i guess that everybody 
with COVID and all, I was thinking about pool. I know we had a couple of pool guys out here. I wonder if that's kind of COVID related. We're stuck around the house, looking at each other like, hey, you know, let's put a pool in, you know? <laughs> so so maybe that, that could be a fad, a current fad, okay? And I did not take that particular trade, but I know some of you guys in here did, so we'll see how that works. So check mark on that one. That is a buy at B, okay? A little bit higher than $20, like I said earlier, but yeah, less than 25 for the shot there's another one just kind of chopping sideways in a like a one point range so let's just bang these out now this one actually did a buy at b it was on my list and i don't remember why i didn't take this one it actually was one two three four five it was on today's close did anybody take lou in here okay i see some people took leslie okay anybody took lou Narrow range again, narrow range. Now this one's kind of interesting. It's above forty dollars a share. So what I would do is wait for a pullback on that. But that might be that might be something we want to watch. MAX on a pullback. It'd be fun to. I know you want to party me, but it would be fun to follow up on these later. Hey, if we could make money off of them, you know, then you could go do something fun with the money. MCFE, obviously, which way is that headed down? Okay. Same thing for MNSO. Now, when they're headed down like that, it doesn't mean you want to completely ignore them. Let's say it goes down and it bases for a long, long time and then makes a cup and handle or something. I think, was it NIO was one of those or NIU? One of the ones we were we had on our radar a while back did exactly that. So you don't want to completely ignore them. And that's the, I think I call it the, the die, the fly, the die. The die and then the fly. Sometimes they die out, base out, and fly. I need to come up with a better name for that. But a bow ties, cup and handle, first thrust, patterns like that. After they, they died out and going sideways for a while. And sometimes a while could be a long time. It's this they come public a little prematurely. Maybe the market's not right. Maybe the sector's not hot at the time or whatever. Or that timing just got awful, or the company really wasn't ready to come public. They get their act together and then bottoms out and begins to take off. MSP, kind of in a range, a little higher price, and the range is fairly tight on that one. So let it break out and see what happens. This one looks really thin. This one looks okay. It needs a little deeper pullback. Keep in mind, we're looking for pioneer setups. And then after the pioneer setup, we're looking for a secondary setup. So in the case of like this max over here, we're going to ignore the pioneer setup, okay? One, two, three, four, five. Technically, you should have bought it based on the pattern about 30, let's say, let's say 37 is what it looks like. I squint my eyes. But because the buy at B, we're not going to buy, we're going to be skeptical above 20. And I guess now we'll change that to 25, maybe make that a little bit more official. But above 30, you definitely want to question it. And then it's also, no, I was thinking of another one. Never mind. This right here, I wonder if that's an ETF. I'm not sure what that is. QQQJ and QQQM. Okay, they are ETFs. Thank you, Donald. Appreciate that. So we would ignore the ETFs. In fact, that's what I woke up early this morning and did was uh, I went through all my IPOs, especially the last three quarter, three months. It's amazing how many stocks are coming public. I, public. I think these companies are just pushing, pushing them out, pushing them out, pushing them out. So a lot of a lot of my time was spent weeding out the ETFs and the units and the warrants and the preferred stocks and all these things that I tend to take out. So last one there, really, really thin range. It also kind of died out. Now this one came public and what did it do? If they price too high, they're gonna die. Okay. Not always, but many times they'll come public at these higher levels and then come right back in. This one here looks kind of thin. It's also super narrow range. Now I did play this one. I don't remember how it all played out. I hope I took partial profits and then stopped out at a scratch. If I didn't, then I then I, I don't deserve the trade. <laughs> but I didn't have time to check my records. But that's a case where you got to buy a B type of setup on, a, on an okay range, not a huge range, but an okay range, okay? Maybe about 40% move 
peak the trough or 40% range. Took off nicely and then unfortunately came right back in. This SQZ, I actually was looking to buy a few shares on the close, but by the time I bought the other one I bought today, which I've already forgotten the symbol, I think I have it here in here's an example. This one was uh, the market was closing and I wasn't I wasn't fully committed on this one and I should have got a lot going on. I wasn't able to do my IPO analysis for the close until right before the close. So I, was, I felt like I was too rushed to jump in. I tried to pick up some in after hours, but the spread was kind of abysmal. Just for S and G type trade. This is another one, thin range. Okay. Now this STTK looks pretty interesting. Now I don't know how thin it is, and it didn't have a whole lot of range starting out. And I guess you could argue that on the buy day, which would have been day one was the high set. So on the buy day here, you could argue that this expansion of range here, measure from there to there, you have enough range. Okay. But what I would do with a stock like this, provided there's enough volume, of course, is let's see what happens when it pulls back, and then look to play that pullback again as a secondary setup. This TARS, I don't know why I didn't trade it. Maybe it's too thin. I've been looking at it. And I did a lot of these, a lot of this I did last minute, and that's why I don't have a, an answer on everything. But we could certainly pull up the live charts if you guys remind me. And I can it'll jog my memory. And like this one, I think was thin. I think the spread was abysmal. Sometimes I'll go look at the spread and it's just it's just not there. So the map is not always the territory, the theory and in practice thing. And that's what I want to kind of come across tonight and in all my shows is <laughs> trading is a lot harder than it looks on the surface. I show you this really simple looking stuff. You're like, I'm going to go out and do that and print money. And in some cases you will, but in a lot of cases, you're going to find it to be a little bit tougher than it is. And if I could kind of temper your expectations and kind of show you some of these pitfalls like too thin or too big a spread, et cetera, then you'll be better off. You'll be in a better position to catch capture these Big move. So anyway, that one nice rally to pull back, but I don't know what's the reasoning. It was the first deep retracement, and then again another die. So you kind of get an idea by looking at that of the what happened over the last month in IPOs. Okay, John Ross says Tars is thin. Okay, so that's why I didn't take it. Now that's one thing I've been kind of noodling with lately. It's like, what do we do? I'm almost tempted, and almost being a keyword in that sense, it's maybe in a smaller S to G kind of way in a small account or something, but I'm almost tempted, like something with the TARS, you know, buy one or 200 shares. Like I almost did that with the SQZ. It's like, ah, eh, I'm not really crazy about this stock, the way it all set up. The spread wasn't fantastic. And I was like, well, let me just got to get a few hundred shares in here. And I just was kind of like not 100% committed on that. But yeah, so the TARS was really thin. So we had to pass on that one. And that's why I passed on it. And I think that's. The reasoning there so thank you john all right so here's one a little bit more than 25 dollars a share so if we put the five day sma in there and require daylight then we have a little acceleration so there's day one day two took out the day one high so we don't have to worry about the day one high anymore day three day four now we have the highest close for the week and it's also the day one high, but that doesn't matter, okay? Because the day the high was set on day two, but you could see that the close was the highest close of the week. So if you extend that forward, you would buy on day five on the new closing high. And it's also above the five day SMA. So we're requiring a little bit of momentum in addition to that new closing high and also closing again above the high of day one if the high for the week so far was set on day one. So there's the Landry light, just means that the low is greater than the moving average. Landry light's been a lot of fun. I've been really enjoying playing around with the ACP indicator and everything and been messing around with that a lot. So this is from the Facebook group. You have to be a gold member at least, or a member of my trading service, which you get gold free if you're a member of the trading service to participate. Gold is only $47 a month. And I think just this little piece of gold makes it all worthwhile. And the reason there's 
obviously various reasons why I charge for this, but one is the group is free, but you have to be a member of DaveLander.com, a gold member. And that just helps to qualify everybody. And so when I come in, like on Wednesday, and I see Mike Peterson says, hey, we've got some IPO setting up. And I'm like, oh, I, you know, I saw this one. I didn't see this one. So I'm looking through my charts like, okay, well, let me make darn sure I pay attention to those. And I was really looking at this ALGM, but I could have easily got distracted and missed it. So it's great to have an extra set of eyes looking at charts. And you can see everybody else kind of chimed in, and I had a few things to say on that one. One reason I wanted to show you that is that my intention, and never say never, my intention is to never show you anything here that I haven't already discussed publicly, either as a direct recommendation to my trading service, the Landry list, which I publish nightly with the trading service, which is a list of stocks that are set up long and short, depending on the market conditions. By the way, right now we're seeing a lot of shorts. Somebody in the group was asking, I think it was Stuart, like, hey, I'm seeing a lot of shorts. Why is that? Well, it's because the market is pulling back from the slide that it had recently, if you kind of want to look at look at it like that. So initially on a rally, you're going to get more shorts than longs, but if it keeps rallying, you're going to get more longs and shorts. Anyway, so that's where we mentioned this stock ALGM, day one, okay? Now we take a look at the day one high to see if that's going to get taken out. Day two, it did not get taken out. Day three, it was almost taken out. Day four, it got taken out. Okay, so we're no longer concerned about the day one high. We're going to buy, and the first day it closes above. The day four high in this case because that's the highest close for the week so this is our new entry right there now here's a one minute chart and here's where i got faked out a couple of minutes before the close i had to put a couple of orders in across a couple of accounts so i when i saw it begin to rally right at the close i knew it was a close above 21 because it was like 21 and 20 and 21 and 30 and 21 and 40. It was really running. So I got in somewhere around 21 40, give or take, depending on different fills. And then initially took off and I got pretty excited about this. And it's kind of like the, the one I showed earlier, RXT. It was really running going into the close. I hopped in and then in after hours, I was already taking profits, partial profits that is. So initially I felt pretty good about this one. And then it imploded. <laughs> the friend of college used to boo, boo, <laughs> had situations. So it was a bit of a bummer. It came all the way back down, actually below where I bought it. So it went into the next day at a loss. Now, when you look at the daily chart, you can see it did not close above 21. It actually closed right at 21. By the way, for the new closing high, ideally you want to give it a little wiggle room too. So in a case like this, 21, let's say 21 and a quarter, I just figured it was up around 21.40. I had a lot going on, I had to get my orders in, and I, I probably rushed it a little bit, got caught up in the moment, truth be told. But I just want to show you that, again, in practice, it's a little bit tougher than sometimes it might look on the surface in a in a webinar. So this is where I actually bought the stock. And then today it had a really, 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 really good rally. Now I did not get around to take a partial profits. I was actually looking to, for a little bit closer to 25. Maybe I'm a little greedy and it just seemed like it was gonna get there, but unfortunately did not. So I probably should have had a more definitive plan in, in place after it kind of tailed higher. I did put in a hard order, a limit order, by the way. You probably want to consider using limits for your exits, for half of your exits on IPOs, because as you can see, this thing spiked up nicely. And in hindsight, eh, it's about two and a half points would have probably been enough. I think I was looking for two and a half. I didn't quite get that. So maybe that's why I didn't get that, get hit on that IPT. PLTR, I have the first week of trading outlined for you here. 
And this is the one I went long to close. I couldn't remember a second ago. So when was the high set on this? When the high was set on day one, okay, so what happens? It goes up a little, it goes down a little, goes up a little, down a little. It's kind of Jackie Mason-ish. And then it begins to rally. Now it makes a new closing high here. What do we do? Well, nothing because it's not above the day one high, okay? And if we look at the range, it's got okay range, 30, 40% range. So that's okay. That's kind of on the cusp of not being enough, but it looks like it's it moves around enough to make it worthwhile. So new closing high, but you're below the day one high. And then the stock just kind of begins to meander, meander, trade sideways, and then bam, it takes off today. And so in this particular case, I bought on close. Now, here's the other thing to notice with this big bar here this big candle i guess is what the candle people will call it if you look at the range up here 12 and change down to whatever it is down here i guess eight or nine maybe eight that's a pretty significant move so that's a big enough range to consider on a buy at b and again there's a lot of caveats i'm trying to throw out as many as i can tonight but there's a few more caveats there so just to show you, this is, I threw this out. I don't have a time stamp on this, but it was before the close. And then Mike chimed in. Also Lou on the close above 1380. John bought a hundred. And then Stuart is hopping on these IPOs, which have been hot lately. And that's why we're talking about IPOs tonight. Okay, any questions on that before I shift gears? You wanted to buy on day four resisting. Yeah, I know. I know one of you guys a bit, a bit private messaged me, private messaging me. Easy for me to say, and he's been buying IPOs like on day one and day trading them, and that's fine. But you just got to be really careful. And I, what I found is just waiting for this one week pattern or a pattern that takes at least one week to develop it seems to be a little bit more robust. And they they kind of trade kind of crazy before they have about a week's worth of trade, okay? I thought the week of chart show was in the US afternoon. It is, it's a, it's a six o'clock central time here. That's uh, Lauren from uh, Australia, sorry about that. Uh, all the shows were set for 11 o'clock central and then the market volatility went nuts and I was a little bit more active in my trading. Some of, the, some of it I probably shouldn't have been doing, watching the screen too much probably. And I decided to move the shows tonight. I've been begged by people in the past to move them tonight because people are off saving lives and repairing automatic transmissions and doing other bad things, defending bad guys. <laughs> okay, Gato is not a US stock. Okay, yeah, so I don't that's probably why I didn't see it in my scans. The SPOCs died off the volatility of the market. Well, that and I think that the market got flooded with SPOCs too. So yeah. But yeah, I think you're probably right on that, John. Okay, as mentioned earlier, if you are a gold member, please join the Facebook group. And we have a lot of good comments there. A lot of times people email me and say, hey, what about this, what about that? It's like, look, you're in the gold, you have a gold membership, you have a service membership, Bring that up in the Facebook group and let's let's kind of hash it out. By the time I'm get, I get back to you, it might be too late. And a lot of times, as I often say, you guys, are, and thank you, and girls, will jump on these comments and answer them in as good or better than I would have answered them because you know the stuff, you know the methodology. So I appreciate that. But anyway, trading can be kind of lonely sport. And as my wife said, it's probably one of the best things that I've ever done to start that group. And I, I just really, I, I never dreamed it would be as good as it is and we've been keeping it kind of small and tight and i'm looking to grow it obviously but i want to i want to do that not overnight i want to make sure we get the right people in there and all you can ask for help if you need some help and then like i said usually other people chime in before i can could do it and signs and signals we haven't we haven't had a lot of ogres lately but we've been talking a little bit or a lot of it about ipos in there anyway i'm i'm a nerd but i think it's fantastic let me go ahead and shift gears. We'll get the charts up and running. Uh, if you guys want to ask about individual stocks, feel free to start doing so now. Feel free to ask any other questions that you 
might want to know. Yeah, I, my apologies again for the, the the show mixed up. I've got a lot going on, and these uh, I I too got the, the the notice that hey, join Dave Landry. The show's getting ready to start. I'm like, oh geez. So we'll work that out. That seems to be a, a reoccurring problem. Doesn't go away. All right, let me get this shared. See if we can make it a little bit bigger. Took some options on CRSR with a strike price of 30 on Monday, sold them today. Reset it now, but is this a good platform? But is this a good options trade? Well, I don't know, Zach. The problem with something like the the CRSR, and let me just bang that question out real quick. Let's take a look at the market real quick, and then we'll get your individual picks. The problem with stock like this, being an IPO and everything, the the implied volatilities are probably ridiculously high on those options. Okay. Hey, Lauren, I'm glad Lauren made it back. Good. Glad you made it back. Anyway, I can't imagine. Did you make money on the trade? Because let me know what strike you bought them. And, and I'm going to go ahead and do the market analysis real quick. But let me know what strike you, you bought them, what uh, expiration, what you paid for them, and what date. Trading options is easy. You just have to get price movement, the volatility movement, and the time, okay? Like I said before, I was part of a hedge fund and I would analyze bonds for the fund and they would say, okay, Dave, what do you think? It's like, well, you know, big blue arrow's pointing up. I think it's going higher. Okay, how much higher is it going to go? I was like, oh, I don't know, five points. So, okay, well, how long is it going to take it to go those five points? I'm going like, I don't know. So it's like you, you have to, you have to, you need a crystal ball in a lot of cases to trade options. And it's, um, it's a tough game, okay? I do trade options on occasion, but it is a tough game. Let's take a look at the P's. I want to flesh out a little sector action in here. Now, it's kind of interesting. A couple days ago, I wouldn't say I was bearish, but I was concerned. And we had a bow tie sell signal. And you can see the moving average just crossed over to the downside. And we had one higher high and higher low. Now, this is a case where the crossing and the higher high and the higher low happen on the same day. But I would count that as a legitimate signal, even though it doesn't fit the, the pattern, excuse me, to a T. But you can see that on this particular day, that was on the third, which I think was Monday, it rallied into the moving averages, but that was actually a sell signal below that low. And then as you know, the market rallied since then, okay? So we avoided a sell signal by not front running it. Now, if we had taken out this low, it would have been a sell signal, especially since you had this top here and top here, okay? Double tops, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for catching that early. <laughs> yeah, usually, I, 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 usually I'm like finishing up the show and they're like, how come you didn't have charts? I'm like, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, what I was saying earlier is, let me just make sure the chart is, is truly shared. Okay, there it is. So I was saying earlier is both time moving averages here. Let's back it out a couple of days and just. So that was a sell signal, technically not to the letter, because the crossing and the pullback happened on the same day. But that's okay. I consider that legitimate signal. And then on that day, it was a textbook sort of setup, especially since it was after partial profits. And then so far we rally back up. No entry, no trigger, no trade. Okay. No ticket, no trade, no tick, no trigger, no trade. No ticky, no laundry. How's that go? Anyway, you can see 20, believe it or not, is already back above the 30. And then the 10 is turning up. And the 10 is going to catch up really quick. By the way, one thing that I kind of talked about a little bit earlier I think it was in the, in the market in a minute, is a little bit of lag is okay with a market timing system. There's a, There used to be the system gurus out there that would say, oh, I have a moving average, I didn't have lag. It's like, no, you don't, Danny. <laughs> but a little lag is actually okay, all right? Especially when you're when you're looking at a major potential top like this. It's okay to have a little lag and then have an entry on top of it. That'll give you a little bit more 
uh, lag, so to speak, or help keep you out of trouble. Excuse me. But you can see S&P 500, less than 2% away from all-time highs, okay? Closing highs, at least. So, so far, so good. Now, somebody was talking about FOMO in here. Let me see if I can find it. Kind of frantic trading, but wanted to try OTM. Okay, that's not what I was looking for. We'll come back to that, Zach. FOMO's increasing, fighting the urge to get too involved. Would the bowtie crossing on the SPY be a good indicator when it get involved again? Okay. The bow ties are designed, or the author's intent, if that's what you want to call it, was to cap capture major highs, okay? I'm sorry, major tops. So if we go back to February, we had the bow tie here off an all-time high. That's a pretty serious signal. And then we all know what happened next, right? Okay. So I'm more excited when a bow tie happens at all-time highs than when it happens in the middle of the range. But proper order and We've talked a lot about proper order in the past and going to watch the Trading Simplified show that I did yesterday, or was published yesterday, which is on the homepage of my website, davelander.com. I'll put a link up in here in post. But I talked about the proper order. Just the proper order in and of itself could help keep you on the right side of the market. So yes, Laurent, if we get back in uptrend proper order, 10 greater than 20, 20 greater than 30, then you might consider being somewhat bullish again or consider it a constructive type of thing. So let's see what happened here. 10 is greater than 20, 20 greater than 30, but then the market pretty much just sold off. Had a little blip up, but it pretty much sold off. So you also pay attention to price action, okay? So the combination of the two can really help keep you on the right side of the market. So yes, what we have here, the 10 is greater than 20, 20 greater than 30, and the price action is confirming, going higher, okay? So yeah, that's that's a good thing to keep an eye on. I wouldn't make that in and of itself your complete market timing, but certainly a piece of it. I would also use the Landry Light on 30 EMA. And again, I think that's also in that show if you go look at it. I talk about it a lot. So all right, NASDAQ composite. Look at that. Just kind of look at that. Look at that trend on NASDAQ. It's huge. <laughs> Let's take a measurement here. I'm gonna guess. Uh, I would guess 2.71 percent away from all-time highs. No, look at that, one and a third percent. Okay, away from all-time highs. Hard to believe. Closing highs. Okay, closing highs are important in the overall market. Closing highs are important. Years ago, I was so lucky to hook up with some of these. Uh, I guess I can't use that term anymore. <laughs> like I said, I think last week or week before, whatever it was. Back when my daughters were still at the house, you know, what are you doing? I'm going to go meet Jim at the mall. Okay. Next day. Did you hook up with Jim? Dad. I'm like, what? <laughs> Did you hook up? Dad. It's like evidently hook up means something else. So I was lucky to know early in my career some of these older, well-seasoned type of traders. And one of them taught me that the closing high is very important. And it's kind of a stealthy, stealthy kind of thing. So yeah, we're pretty close to a new closing high in the, S, uh, in the NASDAQ and not that far away in the S&P. Now look at the Rusty. Rusty woke up. Yesterday I'm like, what's wrong with the Rusty? Kind of in the new flats bill. And then now it's breaking out to new highs with figure. Not all time highs, okay? But it doesn't have that much further to go. It has a little bit of resistance to get through, but another day like today and we would be there. So that's pretty good. One thing I was noticing in my analysis tonight is some newer areas of waking up, such as chemicals, durables, to a lesser extent, non-durables. And as I was explaining to the people in the service, what's also kind of cool is some of these areas today notwithstanding that had been looking a little dubious in here or sideways at best, such as biotech, have it going to take off again? Health services would be a good example too. So we kind of have an old momentum and a new momentum type of market going on here and kind of some stodgy areas like chemicals and manufacturing. You can see banging on new highs in here. And some of the areas that were kind of rolling over again, software would be another one, has pushed higher. Well, that's no big shocker because the overall market has pushed higher. 
but it is important to pay attention to sector action and see if everything is following suit. Semiconductor is pretty amazing there. They never did even cross down to the downside with the bow ties, okay? And see how, see where I'm getting with the lag? It's, sometimes that little lag is not always a bad thing because they were selling off fairly hard in here. And if you'd have got crazy bearish too soon, okay, you would have gotten in a lot of trouble. <laughs> My wife calls the Chinese place. Are y'all crazy? Are y'all crazy busy? No, we China house. <laughs> Anyway, I guess you got to be careful with these jokes nowadays, right? Everybody is so thin-skinned. <laughs> I can make fun of coon asses because I'm a coon ass, so there. So anyway, a little mixed in the market, but overall looking pretty darn good. A couple of areas like the transports, when I say a little mixed, looking a little dubious in here, but today a pretty good day, and they're not that far away from all-time highs, but I am seeing some shorts in the railroads. Not that I wanna rush out and short a bunch of railroads right now or short anything, but I am seeing some shorts in the railroads. I'm seeing some shorts in the REITs and some other, oh, home builders. I'm seeing shorts in the home builders. So I may fire up a trade or two in those areas just for S and Gs, but for the most part, I think I would avoid the short side when this market is within spitting distance of all time highs. Okay, kind of frantic trading, but wanted to try OTM options after watching the grow small account or die trying weekly charts. Oh, thank you. Well, I appreciate that, Zach. I don't I don't want to blow you up though. So what Zach's talking about is I did a I guess it was weekly charts a while back, not that long ago, how to grow a small account or die trying. I'm not sure what got me onto that particular subject. But yeah, you could you could do a lot of wild and crazy things and either parlay an account, do something amazing, or blow it up. And I've seen a lot of people do both. And I think, as I said back in the presentation, I'm not going to repeat the whole thing, but I, I was up close, and up close and personal with a friend who ran about $5,000 to about a million. And uh, unfortunately, we round tripped it. He showed up at my doorstep on the way back down. So I made the difference in the, oh, I accidentally deleted your thing. Okay, so you bought it 97 cents and you sold at $1.30 yesterday, not today. It's kind of why I regret it. Well, that's that's where, okay, so, it, and I know you're probably running a small account, Zach, but if you could, everybody thinks you have to be, and I know you know a little bit more than the average person about trading, but everybody thinks you have to be 100% correct, okay? And no, you could be partially correct. In fact, aim, aim to be partially correct, okay? And that's why I take partial profits. And I don't remember exactly where I took profits on this one. Somebody can remind me from the service or I could pull the spreadsheet. But I think it was on this day here, somewhere probably around where this line is, okay? So I took off half of my shares and in case this turns into a home run, and knock on wood, so far, so good, right? I still have half my shares on. So if you'd have taken off half of your options and still the other half on, what I like to do if I'm if I am doing something with, with S and G type of options, like out the money options or just something that's a bit of a lottery ticket, kind of a gamble. People say, Are oh, you from England? Because you say S and G. Like, no, I'm a coon ass. <laughs> I'm from the bayou. You don't sound like you're from the body. Well, every now and then it slips out, believe me. <laughs> early on, early, I'm not going to say who it was, but it was somebody when I was with a website, they're like, um, you know, there are courses and you can take and they'll help you lose your accent. I'm like, no, oh, I don't, I'm not I'm proud of my accent, you know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, Zach, if you could buy two options, I don't want you to go broke because it's a dangerous thing to do. Yeah, I hear you. You only bought one to keep the risk low. Just trying to learn. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Oh, uh, before I get too sidetracked, what I like to do, let's say I buy an option at 50 cents. Okay. And uh, poor 50 cents is going to become 20 cent now if uh, Biden gets through, huh? <laughs> he looked at the taxes like, wait a minute. Um, before I digress too far, let's say I buy a uh, let's just round numbers. Uh, okay, S and G trade, five hundred bucks. 
I buy 10 options, okay, at 50 cents, okay? Well, if that option goes to a dollar, and almost, almost, what's a, what's a good word? Religiously, it might be a good word. Almost mechanically or automatically, I should say, I'll put in an order to sell half of those options, five of those options at a dollar, okay? So I put up $500, and then I want to get $500 out the trade. I don't worry about commissions too much because it's somewhat negligible. I mean, it would be probably 50 bucks total by the time I'm done. But anyway, I try to get my money back when I'm playing a lottery ticket type of option, okay? That's an out the money, short dated option. It's a lottery ticket option. If I'm deep in the money, trying to get a double is, is really, it's much, much, much harder. But if I'm playing something out the money, then I wanna try to get a double, and then that way I got a free position, okay? Okay. Let's start looking at some individual issues here. SVLP, I don't, that was not coming up, Carol. Is it um, SLBP? There it is. Carol, you've been a bull on these, uh, on these mining stocks for a while. Um, I would say not yet. I'm more familiar with the SLV. Oh, uh, is that mining stocks? Yeah, that's miners. Okay, that's fine. Um, I would say not yet. Okay, so you're still you're still sideways in here. The big blue arrow is still sideways. Longer term, though, I hear you because longer term you got a big thrust higher, and that's something I was noodling with a while back. The boxes. Okay, so technically you kind of have a box up here, although it's wide and loose, and right here it looked a little dubious. But you do still sort of have a longer term trend working on a weekly chart. Pretty obvious trend, right? I wouldn't rush out and buy a new position, but yeah, put it on your radar. If we take out this prior high in here, then yeah, maybe on a pullback, okay? I would ideally want to look at some, like I saw one tonight, it's, it's cheapy, like AAU is banging out new highs with Vigor. Uh, that's a gold stock. So I would wait to see what's going to happen on an individual issue basis. Silver, the commodity, still looks a little questionable in here, but today's action gets, up, gets us back above these moving averages. Now, they don't cross over as soon as the price crosses over, right? And that's that little lag we've been talking about a little bit. But if they continue, if the price continues to stay above it, then they should cross over soon, but we do have some overhead supply to deal with, okay? JKS, it's going to be a solar stock. Yeah, that was on the Landry list a couple days ago. So today would have been a trigger on that. Super, super, super nice trend higher, followed by a pullback. Bam. Yeah. Um, what I would do there is I think it's gone too far to start a new position. But if it came back in, that would be a fake out. Then I would look to get a, get in above that high. Okay. That was John Z. I forget. I get you two guys mixed up. I know you want to see you in the Facebook group, but I'm trying to remember who said what. Yeah, it's like we went through a phase. We had like Carl's. We had like a bunch of Carl's. <laughs> now we had a bunch of John's. Okay, any more? I guess we spent all day talking about them, so there's no, uh, there's not a whole lot more to talk about, right? All right, going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I'd like to thank all you guys and girls for coming tonight. I appreciate you making it, even though it was a bit of a mix-up. If you have any unanswered questions, easy for me to say, daviddavelander.com. All right, one last request, and then we'll wrap it up. B-A-B-A. -A -B -A. Thank you, Zach. Yeah, this one looks like it's on the cusp of rolling over, Alibaba. Okay. Now, when it comes to shorting, I'm not a big fan of shorting a Chinese stock, but... If it's a big, thick stock, this thing is super thick, okay? This thing is not going to double. It's not going to go to 600 tomorrow. I wouldn't think it would, at least, okay? So, yeah, this could be a possible, this is kind of, this is what I call an um, explosion gap pivot, but being a somewhat foreign stock, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too concerned about that gap. But, yeah, if it bow ties down, it's going to have some support at 250. That might be a good problem to have. But, yeah, I hear you, Laurent. So watch that one if you want to short. There's a lot of other shorts I talked about, too, that are possible. But again, if we keep pushing higher, there's going to be no need 
too short unless we really, really, really like it. Or as we often do every now and then, we'll fire off one just so we remember how to play both sides of the market. Well, thanks again. I appreciate it. You're welcome, Dakota. You're welcome, Lawrence. You're welcome, David. Thank you so much. Awesome class on IPO. Oh, you're welcome, David. And and just, you know, as you know, we, we talk about them in the group all day. So ask questions there and everybody else knows as much as I do there. So they'll chime in too. So you're welcome, George. Everybody have a fantastic night. We don't talk to you now and then, which I'm sure we will, but <laughs> have a great weekend. Thank you so much.